Hey, it's Chris. How are you? I'm happy that you're able to join me here for this episode of the show. I just want to give you a quick heads up. The conversation you're about to hear was recorded about three months ago, and my guest is Dan Radin, and he is the founder and CEO of Auxbus. But here's the thing. When I interviewed him was before he rebranded to Auxbus. So you're going to hear me mention Podcraft, and you may have heard of Podcraft, but Podcraft has become Auxbus. And Auxbus is spelled A-U-X-B-U-S. And the website is auxbus.com. You'll see the link in the description. And we talk a lot about Dan's background and, and, a, and a lot of the most everything we talk about that's relevant to PodCraft is actually still relevant to Auxbus. Although with Auxbus, they have added, I think, more features. And you're going to hear Dan talk about some of that. But if you want the current full message from Auxbus, go to their website, check it out. Auxbus is described as the end-to-end -end podcast creation platform for brands. Easy planning and recording and done-for-you production and distribution. So it's a whole platform, does a lot of things. Anyway, had a great conversation with Dan Radin. I hope you enjoy it. Let's do it. Okay, terrific. We're already doing the thing. Dan Radin is here. I'm here. We just need to start this. Barry, should we do like the pre-music banter today? No way. You crazy? All right. Well, sorry, Barry. Jeez. Let's do this. Ah! Ow. I think Woo! I pulled something. You got to stretch. Oh, yes. Welcome to the podcast engineering show. My name is Chris Curran. This is the show where we talk shop about audio production for podcasts. I produce uh, podcasts for all kinds of big companies and medium companies and individuals. And every week on this show, we bring you podcast production techniques on a silver platter. We talk shop with podcast producers, engineers, other specialists, and app creators, and Dan Radin today. Anyway, I have a background in the audio engineering in the music business. And when I entered podcasting, I realized that there was a huge lack of audio skills in the podcasting world. That's where this show can help. And if you implement the best of what you learn here... Oh, wait. That that implies they're going to learn something, Dan. <laughs> oh, this is, this is like 101 for audio engineers. It's like the college for <laughs> engineering your podcast. Professor Thank you. Chris. And if you implement the best of what you learn here your podcast will number one sound a lot better and number two you'll spend less time producing them and i really believe you can produce great sounding audio i do i believe you can and of course uh podcast engineering school is the school i run and today dan raiden is here we we need this we need dan raiden welcome to wow. the show brother thank you everyone really appreciate everyone in the audience all, all, all of you out there in podcast land Oh, you brought your lightsaber? I, you know, it's been charging. <laughs> it's been, <laughs> is it done charging? Oh, uh, that's it's like 80%. So PodCraft, that's your company. Yes. So tell us about PodCraft briefly. So a lot of my job as a CEO is to do elevator pitches because I'm always talking to people, meeting people and trying to find out if what we're building is something that people want. So I've gotten really good at this short elevator pitch. So forgive me, this is going to be salesy. The rest of this hour won't be. We'll have a real conversation. But PodCraft is the professional podcast creation app. We make recording, arranging and remote participation dead simple. And we automate production and distribution. So you talk and we do the rest. Right? Yeah, that <laughs> total uh, website copy sort of uh, overview. But that's great. Like it, it pretty much tells what it does, uh, which is pretty much everything. So I'm, I'm psyched. You and I saw each other at PodFest, and that was the biggest collection of independent podcasters in the world. And when you tell independent podcasters who have been doing their own editing, doing their own production, and doing, doing their own distribution, that you automate production for them, just you see the tears well up in their eyes. So between what you and Podcast Engineering School do as a service for podcasters and what we're trying to do as well, this is absolutely something that people making podcasts need. Right. So we're going to talk about PodCraft. And, uh, but first, we're going to talk about a bunch of other stuff, like your background and the different uh, jobs you've had in the past and your experience. 
So uh, because you're not just some guy off the street who decided, hey, let me create some audio service. You know, it, uh, it, it, it didn't quite happen like that, did it, Dan? Well, thank you. <laughs> I was a drummer as a kid and I loved the gear. Uh, I think the reason I wanted to be a drummer was because they had the coolest gear and then getting into audio, the same thing. You and I are both gearheads. We're always talking about gear. And when I finished college, I was fortunate to get an interview with Sennheiser, who happened to be 10 minutes from where I grew up in eastern Connecticut. Hmm. And I went to work for Sennheiser. I did general stuff, trade shows, price lists, and then an opportunity became available for me to become the Neumann product manager. So Neumann is the super high-end studio microphone brand owned by Sennheiser. They also acquired Klein & Hummel at that time, and they started to fold Klein & Hummel into Neumann over time, and they were oh. separate brands. Now they're one brand. So oh, what were... By the way, when you were, at, if I was ever working at Neumann, I like would would stay late at work, and I'd like wait till everybody goes home, and then I'd like go looking through closets for old like U sixty sevens and U forty sevens and stuff. Right? Did you find so, anything, bro? <laughs> so uh, I mean, a big part of my job was I got paid at, at twenty three to basically just fly around the country and go visit recording studios and talk to engineers about their favorite microphones and what they were using for. So. Uh, you know, a lot of my friends who had gotten out of college were working at banks and waiting tables, and I was just being paid to fly around to visit recording studios and talk about U67s all day. So it was a pretty good job. That's cool. So were you were you talking to them? Like, what was their feedback on that? Well, did you talk to them about the new the, the newer U67 and what they thought of that? This was before that. This was in the era of the M series, the tube microphones, the M147, 149, 150. So this was these were the transformerless tube microphones. So it was a lot of that and visiting a lot of orchestral recordings using M150s because that's really the, the quietest, most neutral microphone that you can find. It's an omnidirectional. And then it was also the time when they were getting ready to launch the TLM 49, which was the old M49, but a transformless version of it and a very vintage sound. So some interesting aesthetic things. And I think that what I loved about that job was really getting deep into the aesthetics of different microphones. You know, it's not just trying to find the most accurate um, scientific sterile equipment. People love Neumanns because they have a particular sonic characteristic that applies on top of your voice or on top of the instrument that you're recording. So it was a very artistic job. Right. So those 150s, you said, what was it? A, is it a T-150? The M-150 tube. It's an omnidirectional tube microphone, and the diaphragm is actually built into the surface of a sphere, and that's what makes it an omni. Oh. And so omnis, as people may or may not know um omnidirectional mics usually are are sound better because they just they don't have to bring in the sound and then do some phasing to make it cardioid or something right yeah basically I mean, it's a much more pure way of recording sound but obviously for speech applications for instrument applications they're not quite as useful but when you're recording a big amazing sounding orchestra in an amazing sounding room omnis are what's used very frequently. Right. Where do they put them in the orchestra? Like right in the middle? A lot of cases I would see we'd go into a church or something like that and they'd be up on these 20 foot stands and they would experiment with different positions right in front of the orchestra, uh, up overhead and on top of the orchestra, or even in the, the, the audience area, they would find the right spot because a lot of recording in those types of situations is trial and error. It's not scientific. It's finding the spot that sounds the best where the interaction between the source content, the music being made, and the room is best because the room, you know, we as podcasters, as studio people, we try to take the room out of it in a lot of cases, but recording in those situations is the opposite opposite where the room is an instrument too right yeah so you, the character of the room plays a big role and that's why the mic placement is hugely important totally so i spent my first seven or eight years of my career at sennheiser and neumann they're amazing people fantastic people to work for very traditional values you know sennheiser has this interesting lineage where they love overhead pictures of their headquarters in Hanover, Germany, and it's shaped like a hair comb. And the reason it's shaped like a hair comb is they never wanted to borrow money. So each time they would make money, they'd build on another tooth on the comb. <laughs> so very, very traditional company, no venture capital, like the way that companies are built today, very slow growth, very conservative, uh, but they make amazing products. And when they come out, they're rock solid and they're best in class. 
So they are never first to class with any first in class with let me say that again. They are never first to market with anything, but when they come out, it's the best. Right, right. So, you know, do you have any contacts uh, that could maybe <laughs> get me like one of those classic U67s? That's like I do have a few contacts over there, and I'm happy to try to make an introduction <laughs> if that's something that you uh, uh, want to sell in a kidney to purchase. Well, they did. They ha so Sennheiser came out with the not Sennheiser. Um, well, it's a Neumann mm -hmm. U67, but Sennheiser owns Neumann now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a Neumann U67, but it's a newer. It's like a. It's like a. It's a reissue. It's a reissue. It's an, it's an and, update. Yeah, it's an update, and, and so I'm sure it's great. And I think they're selling it for what seven or eight thousand dollars, something like that. Yeah, um, like a used Honda Civic. <laughs> yeah, come on, it's worth it. <laughs> but if this is what you do for a living, you know that's a reasonable investment in your craft. Yeah, Barry, would you ever consider buying a mic for <laughs> seven or eight grand? No way. You crazy? Well, like he said, though, if it's your profession, right? You understand that, though, Barry? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, th and ha do you know if they've done any tests, side-by-side -side tests between the new 67s and the, the vintage 67s? I, I would guess they probably have, but that's way after my time with the company. Got it. Um, a lot of what we were doing when I was there, in, additional, in addition to those microphones, was Sennheiser had acquired Klein & Hummel, which was a really high-end studio monitor brand that now they've folded into the Neumann brand. So when you see the Neumann studio monitors, that was part of the Klein & Hummel acquisition. The classic German company. They make amazing, just reference, ruler flat, you know yeah, reference compete, monitors competing only with with the companies like at the genelec level and, and they just make beautiful products wait so i have a pair of neumann kh 120as mm -hmm. is that but but i thought that was from a different originally from a different company right so their predecessor was the klein and hummel o 100 then o 110 then o 120 and that's what became the kh 120a when they rebranded okay yeah, these these KH one twenty A monitors are they're just great. I mean they're expensive, but they're great. <laughs> they are great. They're the Neumann of monitors. And that's what they were supposed to be all along. It's I just love them. They're like a, they're like a, a hair smaller than traditional near field monitors, but the frequency response uh, is is obvious. It's very flat, but it also it does have substantial low end so even though they're smaller mm -hmm. speakers they have a little low end and plus with podcasting like it's not like i'm rick mixing rap music like i need to crank it up and feel the thump of an 808 in my chest it's well, barry it, well that's true yeah oh yeah i mean that's i need to hear barry's pipes <laughs> we true. actually had a guy who was who had come over from genelec when sennheiser acquired klein and hummel a guy named andrew goldberg and he's Finnish. And in Finland, you get basically all of your education subsidized. So Andrew, who was the product manager for Klein and Hummel in Germany, has a PhD in subwoofer acoustics. That's, that's what he has a PhD in. So all of those subwoofers that have come out that are very small and powerful for their size, in some small part are because of Andrew. And Andrew is just an amazing guy who just knows everything about subwoofers. And then later in my career, we'll get to this later, Working at Harman, they've done a lot of acoustic research with multiple subwoofers in a room, so two or even four in a room. And there's really a lot of research and acoustics science behind where we're going in terms of low frequencies. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. I mean, what? so we should ask him next time you talk with him, when, when are we going to get a subwoofer in my cell phone, <laughs> dude? You know, it's interesting. I had somebody contact me earlier today from Waves, the, the plug-in company. And Waves actually has a secondary brand called Max, M-A-X-X, -X, which is technology licensing for consumer electronics. And I just found out about this before we, we started this session. So Max is doing those types of things, trying to take your little tiny cell phone speaker and making it sound its best based on everything that Waves knows and has built in terms of its technology over the last 20 years of producing music. Yeah, that's, it's, that's really interesting to me. One thing, though, I just got a new phone uh, Samsung Galaxy S10, and so what happens is when you buy a ca like a protective case for the phone and you put that on, now when I turn up the volume, it starts rattling the case. It's an acoustic resonator. Well, it's not even resonance; it's like physical, like rattling. Like 
it I mean the case is fairly tight but I guess I don't know maybe the way the speaker in the phone is pointed that it ju- it does rattle the case I mean it's slight right most people probably wouldn't hear it but of course I hear it and it's like really so now I if I turn it up past like maybe 75% or 80% I I hear that you know you hear the sound but then you also hear the little v- v- like little vibration of the of the case, Ugh. maybe maybe Beats will come out with a Beats a base by a base case base case by Dre, <laughs> a base case, dude. That's marketing genius. <laughs> that would <Yeah>. be fucking <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I got to use my one K tone. I love there it. All right, go. so continue. <laughs> so so, so Harmon, is that the next stop on your journey? Actually, no. Uh, before I went to Harmon, I spent a couple of years at what is now called in music. It's the parent company that c- contains Newmark DJ equipment, a Kai professional production equipment, NPCs, things like that. Alesis recording gear. Um, what else do they have? Ion audio consumer gear. Hmm. And then while I was there, we acquired M audio. We acquired Alto professional. We acquired rain, uh, Denon, Marantz, maybe. There's, there's a whole 15 or so brands that they have now. But when I got there, it was Newmark DJ equipment, Alesis post ADAT era recording gear, and Akai Professional. They were the primary pro brands. And I started out as their copywriter. I was writing everything from the things that you read on the website to press releases to the copy that goes on the box of the product to legal disclaimers, anything that had words facing the public was my job for all of those brands. And I learned really quickly how to speak authentically to DJs, how to speak authentically to hip hop producers for MPCs, and then also how to talk to guys like you and me who are regular audio producers, uh, the Elisa's customer, as well as with Ion Audio being sold in places like Walmart and Target, your grandmother, who might be buying a a turntable with a USB output to turn her Johnny Mathis record into MP3s. <laughs> she might want to add 808s to the Johnny Mathis. You never know, dude. Johnny and Barry. <laughs> That's awesome. So you just reminded me, I recently pulled out all my old DATs from mm-hmm. the closet, mm-hmm. uh, DAT, digital audio tape. And it's so when I was working in the music business in the 90s, like we would we would print mixes to dats you know we would print mixes to mm-hmm. half inch tape as well but the dats were like a backup and so like when i was in the studio practicing like practicing mixing i would mix down to dat and so and my when my band recorded we would mix it down to dat so i have all these dat tapes and i also have some copies of stuff which i probably shouldn't have <laughs> uh, i don't know how they got there <laughs> it happens i don't know Jeff Buckley outtakes. I mean, I don't know. I don't. I just. I, no, I'm. I'm kidding. I don't have them, really, as far as you know. But anyway, so I have a bunch of dat tapes, and and I'm like, I I, I want to transfer some of these some of the music on there to the computer, and so I go looking for dat players, and I'm like, where, where where's all the dat players? <laughs> There's no dat players anymore. Yeah. So, so I seen them on eBay. I called a few shops. I, I called a few like pro audio stores, and I'm like, "Hey, do you sell dat players?" They're like, "No, no, no. It's no. been a, not not for many years." <laughs> I'm like, "Oh God." Well, when we were doing a product in Ion, since we're on that topic, Ion made a lot of products that just took old obsolete media forms and digitized them. And one of the products that we worked on was called VCR to PC. So we went and found the last factory in the world that was still making VCRs, and we taught them how to put a USB plug on it. And we made this thing that could take your precious memories of your daughter's piano recital, and you could turn them into really bad digital videos <laughs> that you'll never watch. Right. <laughs> but yeah, you'll watch whole- it once. The whole obsolete media thing is has actually been a recurring theme throughout my story. So before I actually took the Neumann job, I had a brief stint as the HHB product manager. So um, Sennheiser is the U.S. distributor of HHB. And in addition to formerly making some hardware, including a portable DAT recorder, they corner the market on obsolete media. So oh. they make CDRs. DAT tapes, ADAT tapes, magneto optical tapes, all of these things that most people under 40 have never heard of, and even many people over 40 have never heard of. But they had this business that was just, you know, they were the only game in town. And if you were still recording on magneto optical tape, you had to buy it from them. Yeah. 
Yeah, we used to actually HHB DAT tapes were uh, some of the highest quality DAT tapes mm-hmm. you could get back in the 90s. I mean, mm-hmm. Ampex had DAT tapes too, but um, HHB were really high quality. And didn't HHB also make like, um, and, and this is more recently, maybe within the last five or se- seven years, um, they made like a handheld microphone that yeah. actually had a recorder in it. So that was actually a collaboration with Sennheiser. And that was the first time that Sennheiser had worked with another company outside of their orbit. So they took a Sennheiser handheld wireless mic body and capsule and then basically ripped out the wireless radio guts and shoved in a flash recorder. So for a journalist, for somebody who's going into a media scrum, everybody else is shoving you know, a Zoom recorder or even an iPhone in the subject's face and you show up with your thing that looks and feels like a microphone, you get taken more seriously. So that was a great product called the Flash Mic. I think they sold something like 100,000 of them at $1,000 a piece. Wow. So pretty successful for a professional audio product. Yeah, I remember they were expensive. and But, but you know, obviously it was really high quality, obviously. It was, yeah. Yeah, it was it was a Sennheiser capsule. It was a Sennheiser body. I don't. I think it was manufactured by Sennheiser, but I'm not really sure about that. Now that I say that, I don't want to get myself in trouble. Right? Yeah. Maybe the well, whatever. It's whatever name it was under. Um, yeah, I think it was HHB. But anyway, so okay. So in music, you were working with them. Yeah. So I was the copywriter for all the brands for about three years, and I really enjoyed it. And I think that one of the things as I've mentored and coached people coming up in their careers, I've said is if you can find a job where you can write, and that's your job for at least a year, that will make you a better communicator in everything you do, whether it's emails, whether it's speaking. So I really learned a lot doing that job. But then the former Alesis product manager moved on, and Alesis had the idea that they wanted to try to get into electronic drums. So me being a drummer, this was a perfect fit for me. So I got the Alesis product management gig. We really expanded into becoming the fastest growing brand in electronic drums because really there were two strata. There was the Yamaha Roland things that are $5,000 that are super serious. And then there were really cheap entry-level things coming in from China with no brand for $99. And we saw this opportunity to really own everything from five hundred to five thousand dollars in between those two markets and it was really successful. We also got the brand into mobile recording. So the first patent on a mobile recording device using an iPad is from Alesis. It's a product called the IO Doc. And the idea was let's take an IO2 Alesis recording interface, but make it work with an iPad. So we form fit it to the iPad. So you could plug in your microphones, your speakers, it had MIDI. And the whole idea was at some point, there's going to be a standardized way that all of the apps in iOS talk to physical hardware. So let's just be first with, with the hardware and then the software will figure itself out. And this was in the days before the MFI program, the made for iPad or made for I- iOS program. So we really had to work with Apple and figure out the way of working and how our hardware was going to interface with their hardware. So it was a really kind of Wild West opportunity and experience. And that led to a whole series of other products from mixers to DJ equipment to MPCs, all using what we built in the IO doc. So that was a really fun product that huh. helped me cut my teeth and help establish a new category along with the electronic drums. And that's really the areas we pushed it toward. And at the same time, I was doing some grad school work because I had I had a music business bachelors from Berkeley College of Music. And I thought, well, at some point, I'm going to want to start a company company of my own. I knew this for a long time. But I also knew that my bachelor's in music or my music business bachelor's wasn't a real business degree. And I wanted to have more understanding of, well, when is the right time that I need to bring in a lawyer or an accountant or some other professional? And I wanted to know where my knowledge ended. And that was really what getting an MBA was about for me. I wanted to know at what point am I getting myself in trouble by not knowing what I don't know? So I was doing that that at the same time as working for Alesis and flying back and forth because they were closing their their West Coast office. I was living in LA at the time. They're in Rhode Island. So I was back and forth all the time. I was living in New York while I was finishing the degree, going up to Rhode Island every week on the train, just a ton of travel. And I was getting kind of burnt out. And found an opportunity to work with a company called The Loop Loft. My friend Ryan Groose and The Loop Loft makes soundware. 
So it's not software, it's loop content with name brand musicians. They work with, you know, if you want to have Steve Gadd play drums on your song, <laughs> you can download Steve Gadd's loops that they've recorded. Ryan was a fellow Berkeley alum, and um, he was really the one that pushed me forward in thinking, yes, this is something that I can do, starting a business of my own. His was a side hustle that turned into a real thing. And the the kind of the cherry on the on the Sunday for him is he was acquired by Native Instruments last year. And Ooh. he's out in LA and he's got a beautiful house and his family's very happy. So uh, he really helped inspire me to really get serious about trying to find the right opportunity to pursue that was authentic to me. Because for him, he was a drummer. He was working in the music business knew that the music business was kind of slowing down. He had been Clive Davis's personal assistant, which is kind of cool, um, but knew that the industry was was consolidating and knew that he wanted to do something that enabled him to use his drumming and his skills in music and recording, but something unique. And he found that. And that sent me on a search for the next five or so years to try to find my The Loop Loft. I didn't find it immediately, but uh, I took two detours before PodCraft. One was a one-year one year stint working for a company called Steel Series, a Danish manufacturer of gaming peripherals. And I thought, okay, I finished my MBA. I've done all this stuff in the music business. I want to try a bigger, more growing market. And I thought, well, where are all the kids that used to becoming, used, that would have become musicians if it was a generation ago? Well, they're playing video games. So I thought, okay, if I'm doing gaming headsets, this is still audio, this is still what I love, this is still what I enjoy, maybe I can enjoy this. So I went and worked for Steel Series for a year. We turned over their entire headset portfolio. It's still audio. But what I found is gamers spend 90% of every dollar on video and control and 10% on audio. Audio is an afterthought for gamers. So there really was no passion for sound and it just wasn't a good fit for me. But fortunately, I was in a really lucky position when looking to move on where I had Harmon and Bose competing for me. Um, a really, really amazing situation. Um, Bose was looking at offering me a position to work on some of their sound bars, and Harmon has a division called Luxury Audio, and that's what leads us to Mark Levinson. So Harmon has this stable of brands, Mark Levinson, super high-end home stereo equipment, Lexicon, super high-end home theater equipment, and some studio gear, Revel, sort of the Mark Levinson of loudspeakers, which is actually, believe it or not, aside from Harman Kardon, the only other brand within Harman that they actually started themselves. All the others were acquisitions. Revel and Harman Kardon were the only self-started brands. Mm. And then JBL Synthesis, which is you want to build a screening room in your rich guy mansion. JBL Synthesis is the huge speakers that go behind the screen in your screening room. Got it. So I was, I was brought in to work on the electronics and I was working on Lexicon and Mark Levinson. We wanted to get Mark Levinson back on track. So we, we, we started working on an entire new range of products. We did an integrated amplifier for about 20 grand. We did a monaural amplifier for, I think it's 30 grand. So you need two of those to make stereo. So that's 60 grand for a pair of amps. Mm. We did a two channel amplifier, uh, we did a couple of preamps and I got to work on Harman's last ever CD player. So we did a product called the number 519, which is basically an entire Linux computer that has streaming, that has a CD drive, that has USB input, that has digital audio inputs. Uh, and basically it itself is not only a source player, but also a, a digital preamp. So you can pl plug it directly into amplifiers. And if you're only using digital media, then your entire audio file system is done. So that was a really fun project because it really was like, you know, I, I described it a lot of times to people like that scene in Apollo 13 where they've got the bag of parts and tape and plastic water bottles and they've got to figure out how to make the thing work. <laughs> yeah, and That's what it was like because it was such a big systems project. A lot of my other products that I'd worked on had been relatively simple comparatively, but this was an entire computer system. And by the way, it had wireless and it had to be housed in 6,000 series extruded aluminum chassis. Uh. So a lot of engineering challenges to, to hit the price and quality, and, and not to mention the fact that I was embedded with a team of incredibly brilliant engineers who were actually doing the prototyping right next to me. Like you would see smoke because the guy was just soldering resistors and capacitors <laughs> into place, which is totally different from consumer electronics. Right. So learned a lot about quality and about 
really old school, old world audio engineering for uncompromising quality there. And then just as I was getting good at it, Harmon created a licensing deal with Under Armour and created an internal startup to create audio gear for athletes. So I'd spent the last year or two of my corporate career working on $99 Bluetooth headphones and making them sweat proof. And I learned all about all of the minerals that we sweat out and cover our Bluetooth headphones as we work out and how that is the reason that our batteries and wireless performance degrade when we have a pair of headphones that you work out with uh, over time. So we did a headphone that has a heart rate sensor built in in your ear. We did some other interesting things. Uh, got to work with The Rock and do a, a Rock um, celebrity branded headphone, which was cool for the gym. But Harmon was acquired by Samsung and in any change like that, culture changes. And culture has been important to me for a long time. Values have been important to me for a long time. And I knew that if I wanted to work in a place that was fitting to my values, it was unlikely I was going to find it in a multi-hundred person, multi-hundred thousand person organization based in South Korea. Right. And, you know, honestly, I thought, okay, I'm at this point in my career where I've done a lot in tech and I've done a lot of interesting things. I had always wanted to run a drum company. And I started to think about what could I do in drums that could be interesting? Could I do something for the retail experience with artificial intelligence and have you be able to hear the differences between different symbols, for example? Or could we do something in manufacturing with advanced manufacturing with fused uh, deposition modeling or 3D printing or something like that? And I really gave it a good go. And one of the things that I did in trying to find the opportunity was I started a podcast called Drum Showroom, the world's only and number one drum gear podcast, because it's the only one. Um, (laughs) And what I discovered in doing that was how bad the tools were for podcasting. And I realized that somebody probably should fix this. And oh, I guess I probably have the background to figure this out. And after spending 10 years trying to find the right opportunity, the right opportunity found me. So I started PodCraft uh, about four months later, had the idea between Christmas and New Year's, got started January of 2018. We're now, well, by the time this episode comes out, we'll be coming up on a year and a half in business. And uh, by the time this episode comes out, I'm about to break some news, Chris. By the time this episode comes out, we'll be in the process of changing our name from PodCraft to Oxbus. Really? He's stunned, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. Yeah. So, no, I, actually, I was thinking, like, well, when is this going to come out? When are you going to change the name? Because if this comes out before that, but I guess it doesn't matter, really. It doesn't matter. No. So we're, we're starting the transition now as we're recording. We filed some of the paperwork and things like that to start this transition. What happened was, as I was getting started, we just started working. And, and anybody who started a company, entrepreneurs know, you just start working, and then you figure out the details later. Right. And... I realized several months in that there was this guy, Colin Gray, the podcast host, who has done a podcast called PodCraft for four or five years, is very well regarded, and he is a great steward of information and generosity in our industry. So that was kind of strike one that didn't feel good, discovering that. Then Colin came out with a podcast production tool called Alitu. So that was kind of strike two, because you've got the same name and a similar product in the space. Uh, So we kind of made the decision. We didn't want to create confusion in the marketplace and we didn't want to look like we were being bad participants in a very small industry. So that's, those are some of the reasons why we're making this transition. We're going to drop the podcraft name by the time we launch in August and we're going all in on Oxbus. Nice. So how do you spell that? A-U-X-B-U-S-S? One S. One S. A-U-X-B-S. Let me try that again. (laughs) A-U-X-B-U-S. Yeah, yeah. Cool. (laughs) It's good to be able to spell the name of your company. (laughs) And the idea behind Oxbus is I've got three answers. One is what is Oxbus? Well, Oxbus is just like Amazon or Google or Dropbox. They don't really mean anything, right? They're just the name. But for technical people like you and me, we know that the aux bus is where you plug in all the things that take what's happening at the inputs, the literal input signal, and turning it into what you eventually want to happen at the output. And what we're about is taking the literal input and transforming it into the way that you wanted to sound in your head, but you may have not had 
the engineering experience, or you may have not had the production experience, or you may have been in a crappy untreated room with a $20 microphone. We make you sound the way that you want it to sound. That's what Oxbus is about. Got it. And then the third answer is we're the intelligibility company. We're taking your bad recording and making you more intelligible. And there are other things that we intend to apply our technologies to. And, uh, there's some adjacent media like audiobooks that we're starting to look at. And then there's some other applications that we think we're building some interesting technologies that are all about helping people use the power of their voice to communicate better. Nice. All right. So for now, uh, well, I want to get into the, the meat and potatoes, Hey, of, uh, of, of the, the service. So should, as, as I'm asking you questions, should, should I call it podcraft or aux bus? Oh, it doesn't matter. The, the, if, if somebody goes to podcraft.com, it's going to redirect them to oxbus.com. So, okay. it's, it's so then we'll just talk about it in general without naming it from now on. So, yeah. um, so we're, we're a software as a service. So you know, nothing to download, nothing to install. We run in the browser at launch, both on desktop and mobile. Next year, we'll do some apps for iOS and Android. But the idea is we want to make it really, really simple for people to be able to record with whatever gear they have in front of them. We prefer that you use some kind of microphone, but we even can work with the microphone that's built into your laptop. You definitely want to wear headphones if you're using the microphone built into your laptop. But we work with wired headphones, Bluetooth headphones, USB microphones, professional microphones, uh, pretty much anything that can record audio we can work with. And we make it simple to make it sound good. We automate some of the basic engineering steps. So as you're recording, we're uploading progressively, uh, similar to what some of the other uh, um, remote participation companies do. Right. We send it off for processing immediately to our cloud. So we do basic level adjustments, we do DSing, we do compression, and just some of the basic you know, four or five things that every engineer does to every piece of audio ever right. to save time when a human producer puts their hands on it. Because we know that Automation and software and artificial intelligence and all of those fancy buzzwords, they're great, but there's no substitute for a human producer. So our intention is to automate things that we can automate and make our producers super powered by giving them the information they need in the right time and preparing things for them so that they can be more efficient. And, you know, one of the things I loved in your Chris's goodie bag episode, PES episode number 122, mm. uh, great episode, by the way. Thank you was talking about efficiency. And part of that is audio editing versus content editing. But part of that also as an editor or a producer is talking about getting paid by the hour or getting paid by the gig. Right. And our whole vision is if producers are getting paid by the gig and we're making them more efficient, then they can make more money. Yes. Yeah. So if a podcast producer or editor is going to be paid per episode right a flat fee per episode then yeah whether it takes them an hour to do it or f 10 hours right. they get paid the same so then they would want to do it faster which is what you're helping them do right the buzzword is machine learning coaching networks so this is basically giving you the right time the right information at the right time based on the content and context of what you're working on so all right well now i am going to ask you so when when you record something with your system and the tracks, like you, you do, let's say an interview between a person A and person B, mm -hmm. and you record. They record an interview. Um, first of all, they're connecting through your service. Yeah, so we can work with multiple remote, multiple local participants as well as remote participation, up to four and maybe five soon. And we are doing virtual tape sync. So we have a WebRTC in the browser internet connection, just like Skype or Zoom, but we're recording each participant locally, uploading them automatically, connecting them, time syncing them, and keeping them in sync throughout the entire recording. So it's just like we're all in our own studios recording, but none of us have to do any uploading or time alignment. Got it. Right. And that's also very similar to the other services. Um, mm-hmm. Yep. So, okay. But now that the audio is uploaded and the system is going to do some processing, in like you said, mm -hmm. in terms of leveling and some compression and DSing and stuff, mm -hmm. um, is all of that done just automatically or are there, can I tweak what processing is done to each file or anything? 
So what we're doing right now is we're getting ready to launch two tiers of service in August at Podcast Movement. What we're calling our basic or standard level of service, which is fully automated. And we're going to test prices, but it's going to be somewhere in the $50 to $100 a month range. And then our fully professional white glove, hands-on, minute-by-minute human production service at $1,000 a month. What we'll do over time as we get more and more capability in the software is add in between tiers. So we'll have, say, a $50 tier, a $150 tier, a $250, $350, $450, and it goes on. And those will get you different levels of human production or quality checking or content editing or story curation or sound design, those kinds of things. So our software will get more capable over time, but we'll also optimize how we deploy the people in the sort of human in the loop to use a, a an Elon Musk uh, uh, ism. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really interesting. I've often thought of per like me personally, because everyone knows I produce podcasts every day and I also run the podcast engineering school, but I've thought of like just saying of offering a service and, and, I, and I'm not going to do this. So don't, and no one worry, but, um, I thought of offering a service where it's like, hey, just send me the raw track and I will just mix it basically. Like mm-hmm. EQ, compress, DS, deplosive, D everything. Like I will take the the raw track and just make it as best as it can be and send it back to you. And then if you have a host and a guest, then I could do that for both tracks and send it back to you. And then all you gotta do is line it up in your in your DAW and, and do it. Um but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, anyway. Um, well, that's basically what our standard level of our fully automated product does. It does all of those things, including the lining up of the timing, but then it also does assembly. So you've done your arrangement and said, I'm going to have an intro, an opening monologue, a main conversation with my guest, maybe an ad, some joiner music, outro, and closing credits. So you've recorded or uploaded each of those things. We also assemble those, mix them, mix in music if necessary, music beds if necessary, all of that is automated. So that's our basic tier. And then we push it off to your host and send it out for distribution. So all of that is no human touches that. We can do all of that now. Yeah, yeah. What we'll look to add is more of things like being able to choose fades and types of interior fades and sound design and some of the more esoteric things that, you know, we want to we want to hit the 80 and the 80 20 to get started right yeah so the the basic service sounds great i mean that's so cool like if you can just you know have the podcast host record their intro in 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 a certain in a file and Mm -hmm. and upload that or or just record it right into the system and then the same thing closing credits and I, i love the idea of having just recording different pieces including the ads and then just handing everything over to you guys and then you guys can stitch it all together and obviously level it. And then if you can actually put music in between and sort of transitional music between stuff, I mean, that sounds awesome. Thank you. It is. It is awesome. Our our software engineering team is pretty brilliant. And I think that considering that we have basically a contract engineering team of one and parts of several other people, we've done pretty amazing things. And uh, I've done none of it. (laughs) I've just kind of guided them in the right direction. I feel like this job, you know, product management prepared me a lot for leading a startup because as a product manager, you don't actually do anything, you know, Uh, you write the spec, but then other people actually create the product for you. And I always like to refer to it as being kind of like either the conductor of an orchestra because you don't actually play the violin. You just make sure the violins come in at the right time or the manager of a baseball team. You write the lineup card, but you don't actually swing the bat. Right. So before I forget, I want to ask you about the syncing of files. So it's pretty much well known that some recording services, and it's, it's, it's random and sporadic and intermittent, but some recording services, when they get, when you get your files from them, they don't line up in time, and so like someone will someone will stop talking, and then it'll take like too long for the person to answer, and then when the person's finishing answering, the person comes in asking the question and steps on them, and yeah. they overlap, and it's just really confusing. It just makes it not like a real conversation. So how do you uh, avoid that? Well, that's one of the inherent limitations of internet-based recording. So you might hear it as VOIP, voice over internet, 
or WebRTC is the, the platform that a lot of services like Skype and Zoom use. So we're using WebRTC for the real-time conversation, but you don't actually hear the WebRTC conversation in the finished podcast. You hear our two local recordings. So where this comes from, and people may not be aware, and I'm sure you are, but for everyone's information, this is based on tape sync. So if you're working at an NPR station and you want to interview some farmer who can't get to an NPR station to be interviewed, you will hire an engineer to go to the farmer while he or she calls you on the phone, does the interview in real time. You're not going to use the phone call audio. The phone call audio is just there for time sync. And then the engineer is going to shove a shotgun mic in the farmer's face, record the farmer, and you're going to combine the studio recording of you in the studio with the farmer on the shotgun. So it sounds like the farmer was in the studio with you, but in reality, he or she was out in the field, maybe even on a tractor. Right. So that's what we're doing in software. Right. And I know actually, uh, what is it? Tentacle. There's a company that makes sync, these little sync things that um, people love for video. So you can sync, like you literally sync them together, like two of these tentacle things, and then they stay synced for like 24 hours, like literally. So then then you attach them, you, you attach those two little tiny sync boxes to different recorders. And then it, so when the audio is recorded, it's almost like it's time stamped along the way. And then so when you put those two files together later, the software can just literally line them up precisely mm-hmm. like that. We have some, some uh, since I don't know when this is going to come out, I'll just say we have some proprietary thoughts and designs that are in the protection process uh, as far as how we do this. So it's hard. Um there's a reason that nobody's gotten it right yet. Uh, I don't know if we've gotten it right yet, but we hope we are closer than anyone else. But <laughs> honestly speaking, the more of us competitors are trying to solve this problem, the closer we collectively as a community will get to having a great solution. So uh, I don't feel like uh, Squadcast or Zencaster or any of the others, CleanFeed, uh, I, I, they're competitors, yes, in terms of what they do is a feature of our platform. But we think we've got a unique take on it. And the more that we all push each other to get better, the outcome for podcasters will be good. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll get to a point where it starts to become really stable and really reliable and mm-hmm. uh, and, and faster in terms of production. Because right now, I... Well, I've talked about it before, but I like right now I'm recording our conversation in many different places at the same time. But I'm going to take your track, your local recording track, and I'm going to have to line it up to the actual live conversation. And I actually do that manually in my DAW. And mm-hmm. it doesn't take a long time because it's usually not off by, by very much. You know, sometimes I'll have to just clip. Like if it's an hour long conversation, I might have to clip it in 10 spots and just slide it to the right or the left a hair. Mm-hmm. It's not a, yeah. not a big deal. But again, it's something that we're working with computers. It's it, this is science. This isn't art, you know, it should just line up the tracks. That's what it should do, right? Yeah. Um when I was first getting into editing my own podcast, I discovered that if you clip out all the spaces, everything moves a lot faster and people stay engaged and people started telling me if you take out too much space, it feels anxious. It feels like there's no time to breathe or process the last thing. So there is some art to getting that timing and spacing right between question and answer. And it's just not as simple as just saying, let's push your track and my track through the Play-Doh factory and just whatever comes out, comes out. There's, yeah. There is definitely a lot of technique to that. Yeah. Yeah. And what you're talking about is editing. So mm-hmm. when, when after you mix a conversation, let's say, then you're going to edit it. You're going to tighten up the, the spaces or take out ums and that's editing. And yeah, that, that, I don't, I don't know how that would ever be done by a computer. I mean, a, a human being has to hear that and make sure the editing, the final edit sounds natural. Like naturalness is the goal, right? That's the, like the end goal. But for, for lining up recordings of tracks though, that is science. That's like, that's just I mean I I I've even thought of like for services like yours like they should somehow sync everyone's computer with the atomic clock or something right right and totally. then everyone is synced and then if you're recording at 48,000 you know kilohertz which is 48,000 samples every second it should line up 
but you would think it would be but <laughs> the more i learn about the internet the more i understand why nobody has solved this problem yet in a really complete way got it but you're gonna love what we are working on with what you just talked about as far as the length of spaces and the ums and ahs ah. so we're we're actually starting training machine learning to be able to identify and classify unwanted sounds and crutch words so ums ahs expletives coughs sneezes you bumped into the table and there was some structure born noise up through your microphone so in the short term we're training machine learning to be able to mark those things in the in the metadata of the file so that it, again the whole idea of making the editor faster super powered and in the long term we think that we might be able to actually remove those automatically with software right yeah i mean that's that seems to be a long way off but I, but w w i'm sure we can get there there's no well, reason we shouldn't be able to get there so the google speech to text engine is supposedly over 90% accurate now and I don't know if you've tried, there's a software called Descript from Andrew Mason, who was the Groupon founder. Right. And what it does is you upload audio files into it, like a, like a recording of a speech, and it spits out what looks like a Word doc on top and a waveform at the bottom. And as you edit the Word doc, it edits the waveform. So right. if you take out a paragraph of what I just said, just like it's a, a word processor, it removes that from the waveform. And they're using right. the Google machine learning speech to text engine, which is really pretty accurate. I mean, not accurate to the point where you can just run a podcast through it and have a transcript that anybody's going to want to read as a blog post, but good enough for that purpose. So I, I believe that with companies like Google who have lots and lots of engineering talent and money, we will get there. Yeah. And I, I always thought for transcription, like for Trans transcribing a certain speaker like i i years ago got the uh i forget what it's called it's some so oh dragon naturally speaking mm -hmm. software and like yeah that thing i'm telling you it took like they made me go through like an hour of training they had me yeah. read all kinds of stuff i remember my dad my dad was originally a chemical engineer and then he became a doctor so i saw him learn a whole new set of skills which i think probably prepared me to move between different careers and be okay with starting over. Um, but as he got started as a doctor, I remember him going through exactly that same experience you described, the hour-long training. And he grew up in New York, so he kind of had the Brooklyn accent and, <laughs> right. uh, you know, uh, toity toid and toid kind of thing yeah. instead of 30, 30, 3rd. Uh, but, but I remember how long and painful it was to train it. And now it's, you know, you get your, your Amazon uh, cylinder speaker. I don't want to say it so I don't trigger it. Oh. But... But, you know, you take it out of the box, you say three or four things, and you're done. Right. <laughs> and there are companies like Nuance, which is the company behind Dragon, and NTT, and a few others that are really doing amazing things with speech recognition, particularly being able to recognize direct path sound versus reflective sound. So you can imagine what we might be doing with those types of things as far as maybe we don't care what your room sounds like as long as we can identify the direct path of your voice. Right. Because maybe the room becomes irrelevant. So we really have a lot that we're kind of, we're, we're really investing heavily on the R side of R&D while people can see the D. But yeah. we really are a research and scientific company. And I think that what you were trying to get at in illustrating my background is that I've got a lot of connections from my past to lots of tech companies. And a lot of the people that I've worked with at some of those companies, Harman, Sennheiser, have moved on to work at some of those next generation technology companies. So... Not to say I've got the biggest Rolodex uh, or anything like that, but um, there's a lot of smart people that uh, are willing to have interesting conversations with us. So we're, we're really excited about where technology is going to allow us to help podcasters go. Yeah, and that's one thing I think of like when you watch a Star Trek movie or Star Wars or some movie that's like set like 500 years in the future, like they'll they'll use like these little almost like little walkie talkie things but like they don't have to be near a microphone or anything and it's like they just mm -hmm. talk and then the other guy he understands them perfectly <laughs> and it's like so what you were saying about like getting rid of room noise and reflections mm -hmm. it's it, totally possible um it's gonna have to take some i i because i've thought about this I, I i think about these things i'm a very i i, I think way into the future like too far that, that's like one of my problems. I think too far into the future of stuff that c just can't be done right now. And like the way audio is recorded now, 
like just the physical way. You're just capturing sound waves and turning it into electricity. Like there's going to have to be another element to that just basic, you know, changes in air pressure, hits a diaphragm, then becomes electricity. There's going to have to be more to it than that, like maybe different sensors in different areas of the room or something. I don't know what, but... Um, but well, I know there's we, been yeah. some interesting research on laser microphones over the years. I don't know if they've ever done anything non-scientific, you know, acoustic with them, but I know for things like measuring cracks at Antarctica and in the glaciers, they use these laser microphones to be able to detect the changes in the climate. So for those kinds of purposes, there clearly are ways to use sound and capture it in a different electroacoustic right. paradigm. Right. So that's it. Cause like I, I've often thought of that. Like if you had something pointed at, again, some future te technological thing pointed at my head and say, look, whatever sound comes from that, pick that up, but literally right. disregard all the rest. <laughs> Well, that, that is something that is being done today with artificial intelligence, being able to figure out where the mouth is on somebody. We can do that today. There's plenty of tech demos of that. And then the challenge is, can you figure out which sounds are coming from that part of your face right. and only pick up those? And, right. you know, that's not as far off. That's not as Star Trek-y as people might think it is. That right. That's happening now-ish. So we're going to, you know, man, we're going to have to talk again because first of all, we got to go, but I got to go, but we didn't do the speed round of, of your, of your audio setup. But first of all, before we do that real quick, um, I just want to say, so Podcraft and Auxbus, Podcraft is becoming Auxbus and everyone can go, you know, I have links to it in the show notes as well. And we're going to have to talk more, uh, just off the record because I have a ton of ideas and. Um, I mean, I'm just waiting for someone to create something really awesome, and it sounds like you're on your way there. So anyway, we can I talk appreciate about that. that. Thank you, Chris. And off the record or on, I'm I'm pretty pretty transparent, and I think that there's not a lot of value in not telling people what you're working on because then you don't find out if it's something that people want. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, hey, maybe we'll do uh, a different type of uh, podcast engineering show episode where it's just like, you know fireside with chris and dan <laughs> the the podcast <laughs> the podcast app engineering show <laughs> cool all right well tell us real quick speed round and you got to do it quick what mic you're using what interface is plugged into and what you're what you're recording on or how you record in your computer all right so the audio files among the listeners are going to hate me for everything i'm about to say no. so i've got an audio technica at 875R short shotgun. I think it was about $159 on Amazon. It's great. I really like it. It just happens to work really well for my voice in this barely treated room. Uh, a generic pop filter, a generic shock mount. Uh, I'm actually on the most expensive part of this setup is my blue mic arm, which I think was $200. Hmm. It's plugged into a PreSonus audio box USB 96, which we recently learned that if you place it too close to your MacBook Pro, it creates interference noise. So don't do that. Well, it could, it might. I know there's some issue with the newer uh, MacBook Pros that have the T2 chip because they have the the touch bar. Oh. So I just got this machine and I realized as we were talking that might be the issue we heard earlier. Okay. So it's a pretty simple audio chain. Um, I'm, I'm on Sennheiser HD280 Pro headphones um, with PodCraft labels on the sides. Nice. Um, that's, that's the whole thing. Um, I'm in a barely treated room with maybe $40 worth of foam panels. Um, there's cars going by on the highway behind me. I hope they don't get picked up too much, but I know that if they do, one of the industry's best engineers will take them out. <laughs> oh, geez. Well, thank my you. Dogs, that was a my great... My dog's tags are also taped together. That's a pro tip there. Wait, what? what is? My dog's tags are taped together for this recording, which is a pro oh! tip because he always wants to be in here, but you can't have him jingling when he shakes himself. Barry, that is an awesome tip, isn't it? Oh, forget it. I'm telling you, dude. Forget it. Oh, forget it. All right. Well, we got to go. So uh, check out the sh the link in the show notes, everybody. It's PodCraft, but it's becoming Auxbus. And this has been me talking to Dan Raiden. Dan, this has been awesome, man. Thank you, Chris. I enjoyed it so much. And thank you for everything you do for our industry. 
Oh, sure, man. I love it. As you can tell, uh, I love it. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have another conversation soon and uh, maybe a little fireside chat. But you know what you have fireside to do. You chat. have to yell sound great at the very end. Right? All right. I'm back up. All right. I'll tell you when. All right. And everybody, thanks for listening. If you have any questions, seriously, comment on the post or send me a note. I'm here to help. All right. All right. And I want you to yell at home, too. Okay, go. Sound, sound great. great. Yeah. Uh, no way. Hey, crazy. You walk away from me where And you can't play that part so well But you're playing out on me now, now You like to lose control where It's quite a thing that is in me They have their blood and risk in time now, now You tell me that you found something better How should I respond? Yeah.